So the first the first thing I want to talk about is what is this uh, what it is this uh, example is about. I can show you the code first, and uh, let me. This is in the non-blocking. Let's just look at the non-blocking version. Non-blocking. So it's in this uh, non-blocking point-to-point directory, and it's called stencil.c. Okay, so oh, all right. Ooh, that looks pretty bad. Um, so uh, as you can see, the the code has what three three hundred fifty five lines, but it's actually um, it's actually uh, there's a lot uh, code that is just to handle how the input parameters are are being processed. And uh, let me explain a little bit what the code is about. Okay, so um, this is uh, essentially if you if you know this is uh, essentially a stencil uh, stencil uh, kernel. Uh, what the what the hands-on example is, and this this kind of uh, this kind of uh, uh, computational kernel has been used in many scientific applications using using to solve uh, partial uh, partial differential equations and all that stuff. Okay, so the the example we have here is what we call five point stencil, uh, which you, you will see uh, what's going on. So uh, the problem in that that we model this um, uh, hands-on code is, uh, imagine we have a we have a metal plate, a, a metal plate that is a given dimension. In this case, it's a square that you can set, and we have some uh, heat source in in this. On, on this plate, and they will, will in each iteration of the simulation, we kind of uh, pumping a fixed amount of heat in in each iteration, and heat will uh, dissipate on this plate. And after, let's say, after the 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 question is after ten iterations, how mu how much heat is on on the plate? Okay, and and and, and a more a more advanced question is what what is the heat distribution on on this plate? So the first thing uh, what we do is we, we model this plate into a 2D mesh. So each point represents a, um, a coordinate in, in, on, on this plate, which uh, can contain some heat. Okay. So in order to calculate how the heat dissipates, we basically have to, you have to uh, for each, each point, you, maybe you're the heat source and you're propagating the heat, or maybe your neighbor has some heat and, and is getting transferred to you. So for each of these nodes, uh, for each of these coordinates, or, or each of these points, in order to update the value, you have to know what your, what 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 is the value of your neighbors is, and and calculate your value based on them. So that's that's why it's it's called five five point stencil. So you as one point, and you have four neighbor, uh, uh, northeast and southwest. Okay. So um, so in and imagine if we have this uh, this huge two D mesh that is, that is too large to be solved in using one computer. Maybe it's too large to fit in the memory. So we want to parallelize the pro problem so we can use multiple machines. And and the th the first thing uh, we're trying to do here is to uh, divide this global data structure, this global mesh, into small pieces that we can. Um, Give each piece to one of the node or one of the process, so for them to figuring out uh, their part, and and so that we can uh, collectively um, solve the problem. Okay, so that's that's for that's what I uh, what we usually uh, refer to as uh, uh, decomposing your uh, decomposing your your problem uh, in in this case into uh, small pieces. Okay, so and still, uh, so the the calculation for each process is. Just within within each each uh, each sub blocks here, you can each process will still do the same uh, calculation. But the problem is, um, well, well, the, as you will see, the problem is when you, when you have the some of the boundary points that you do, uh, that you need the uh, uh, that your the neighbor information is not available in your local process. That that's where you need you need to do some communication. 
So uh, the code, the, the actual important part of the of the example code are roughly four steps. So the first step is the domain decomposition, and uh, uh, basically it's figuring out uh, figuring out which uh, as as a process uh, where where I am in this global grid. Okay, let, let's say that the global region is what 100 point by 100 point. Um, so, so maybe I have um, um, ten processes, and I want maybe evenly distributed this this global uh, grid into ten pieces. So I need to figure out how much data I should be I, I should own on the on this grid, and more importantly, which part of my data is in relatively to the the global data structure. Okay, so in, in this in this example here, we have like nine process. Okay, and basically, what you need to figure for for the for the process in in the center piece, you need to figure out. Oh, I need to uh, I need to take care of this much of data, and I also need I also need to figure out uh, the my data begins from this point. Okay, assuming all all this uh, all the data here, we're assuming row major. Okay, so you're filling out, uh, you're filling out row and then then column. Um, so you need to figure out well what is the specifically what is the coordinate of this this point in the global grid. In this case, will be um, in this case will be zero, but uh, this will be there's some offset. So as you, I, I will show you in the code where where that code is, and I also need to figure out what uh, who are my neighbors. Okay, so in this case, we have nine nine processes. So the the rank will be from zero to eight, and the one in the middle here uh, will be rank four. Okay, so then for he he will be able to he need to figure out that my north neighbor is rank one, and my east neighbor is rank five, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that that's that's how you can. Uh, that's how you know who to talk with and ask for data. Okay, so that's, so that's the first step. Um, and with that, uh, as I mentioned, if we have a have a have a point that we need to update that sits on my boundary, and I can I can try to do calculation, but you, I realize that there I don't have a I don't have the data that that my north neighbor has, which is exactly this point. So that's why uh, that's when that's when you need to do some uh, communication to do that. Um, w without without any uh, sophisticated design, you can you can say like I I need this data and I just communicate for the, for this one piece of data. You can do that, but that's not not the ideal way. Okay, so the ideal way um, or or the the common way that we do this is uh, create a what we call a halo region. A halo region is so. Assuming that the this is the uh, um, this is the memory that you have, and all the all the white uh, all the white cells are the data you own. Okay, this is this is the the white cells are 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 the same as as the, the figure here, and the yellow the yellow cells are the data that your neighbor owns. So you you don't you don't calculate those data. You just receive from your neighbor. And of of course, this this is a copy of your neighbor, and your neighbor will have a copy of your your boundary. And there we we have a very fancy uh, animation that to show how this works. So uh, basically, the the application would uh, if if assuming the the size of the data you own is bx by by, uh, essentially we uh, allocate a region that is bx plus two by by plus two. So for all the in order to update all your local data, the boundary is is available at at each iteration, and the corners are corners are not used in this case. But if you assuming if you uh, talk to eight neighbor instead of four neighbor, then then you have to also use the the corner uh, in this halo region. Okay, um, so uh, with that we can actually uh, doing the calculation. And so the third step, uh, or or the third big part of the of the example code is uh, is where the app communication happens. So, like I said, you you have a copy of your of your neighbor's boundary data, and in each iteration, 
you want have uh, you want to have the latest version. So you want uh, you want to ask your, uh, your your neighbor should send the the latest version to you, and so you also need to send yours to them. So the 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 things happens like this: your neighbor will send their their the data in the deep blue into your Halo region, and you will send your boundary, which is in the in the light green, into their into your neighbors. Okay. So again, this is what a, a halo exchange is is being done. Okay. So after this, all the all the process have the latest data for the next iteration of calculation. So you can um, uh, and then do the calculation and then uh, do next round of uh, communication. So it's always a bunch of calculation communication is sort of synchronize each other and then next. And then we go back to the beginning and do in the next iteration. So um, yeah, and the last step of the of the code is essentially just a one collective call, which just call MPI or reduce. But in in our in our hands on example, we're we're not going to uh, write write code for this for this. But basically, just just there. This is the what uh, how we calculate the the final. Answer to our problem, which is what is the total heat on the on the plate. Okay. So uh, that's the four big pieces, and let me show you uh, in the code. Okay, so here, if you look, if, okay. So I'm I'm just going going to point out the going to point out the, the lines we're looking at. Let's go to the line ninety of this uh, uh, non-blocking P2P slash uh, stencil dot C. Okay, so here is. The Rx Ry is um, is the is my position um, as as a process in, in the global grid. Okay, in, re imagine reimagine that three by three process grid. So basically, is uh, I'm assuming each each row of this grid has has x processes, and then you use your rank to uh, mod by x and and divide by x. You're figuring out what uh, what what your coordinates is. And then, based on that, you can uh, calculate your four neighbors: north, north, south, east, and west. And there's a trick here. Okay, so for for any neighbor that doesn't exist, you can use MPI proc now. Uh, this is uh, this is constant. That's basically if you use this in your communication, uh, communication won't happen because essentially you're just saying I'm communicating with a uh, with a. Uh, Non-existent neighbor or, or 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 process. Okay, and then the the last part here is basically figuring out the BXBY, which is the size of my data, the data I own, which in in the location will become BX plus two by BXBY plus two, and off X and off Y is uh, the the offset of my data region in in relative to the global grid. Okay. So that's the domain decomposition, and then there's a there's a function called a uh, allocate buffers, uh, alloc buffs, uh, which which is where the the memory allocation happens. So the the big part here in this in this loop that start from line one twenty six is the this is the main the main loop in each iteration there the, this is where the communication and also the, uh, the computation happens okay so in in this in this version we first we packed the old data the the current data into uh, four send send buffers which is s buff north south east and west and then uh, using that send buffers uh, we send those data to our neighbors so we're issuing five uh, MPI ISIN. And then we also receiving four pieces of data from our four neighbors into these four receive buffers, the R buffs. And, um, and then there, we do MPI weight all to weight the completion for all these operations. So after this point, the, the communication is done. Okay. And then we we do we do unpack data. Essentially, this is a this is just moving the data from the 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 receive buffers into the halo region of the of the AO matrix. Okay, and then the update the update grid function will do the calculation, and at the end of the at the end of here we just um, the 
the updated result will be in this A new matrix, which is also BX plus two by BY plus two. And then we just swap the pointer. So in the next iteration, uh, when the communication will actually um, sending the data from the AO uh, matrix, uh, matrix in this case. And, and after all the iteration is done, uh, there's a, we'll call the MPI reduce to, to figuring out what is the total sum. Uh, total sum of the of the heat on the on the region on, on the entire data region. Okay. So um, as you can see, there's a there's a, there's a very interesting type, a very interesting step that we're doing here is is what we call the the pack on unpack. So uh, as we know, we all we need to do is uh, sending our boundary to my neighbor's halo and and get the, my neighbor's boundary in my in my halo, and that should happen. Uh, that should happen with the AO. This is this is actually the the matrix the the data that we're doing calculations on. Why do we need all these send receive buffers? And so the answer is that for your east and west neighbors. Your, your data, your boundary data is not contiguous in, in the memory, right? Because when uh, we, we we visualize the we visualize the data region as as a matrix, but in the memory, okay. So we visualize our data our data region this a old um, a old uh, memory buffer as as a two D uh, as a two D matrix, but in the memory they are. They don't have this to the um, organization. So your your boundary here, your your, your west boundary and your east boundaries, uh, which seems contiguous on on the on this view, is actually uh, not contiguous. All the data is uh, each cell is um, separated with each other by the length of the of this row. So um, the problem is is that we can't just in the current form we can't just say send this send this boundary using in, using one send because that that doesn't work then we have to basically uh, move these non contiguous data into a contiguous buffer and send that buffer and whenever we receive the, the we receive the contiguous data we have to copy that into this non contiguous region so there's a lot of memory uh, memory copying and the moving data around happens, which is takes takes a bunch of time. But honestly, there's just overhead. Yes, uh, we can use that, which is what I'm going to talk about. So in order to uh, address that uh, problem, we uh, one thing we can use is called MPI data types. So uh, data type basically uh, allows user to communicate. With a with a with a buffer that have non contiguous data or or data in any any shape or forms. Okay, so it doesn't have to be like like the, this column is uh, honest honest is pretty regular. We can have we can create arbitrary any 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 um is any um shape and form of data layout. You can be and once you decide uh, define it, you can use use it in MPI communication as if they are con Contiguous and, and the library will handle it. So there's a there's a bunch of uh, constructor that we uh, that MPI provides uh, for you to create these uh, data types. Okay, so um, just just a, a brief overview. We we have some, we have the basic contiguous type and the vector type. As you uh, if you uh, imagine that this is these these two types are roughly what we needed for. Uh, just to solve the solve the problem that we have on hand, but uh, apart from that, we also have more complex index type, and and we also have a struct. Then you can mix match them, and you can uh, cascade them. So you can basically there's in there's infinite infinite amount of different uh, different data types and different layouts you can create with all these functions. Okay, so um, and and those are those are the derived data types. So um, so the first one uh, we I'm going to talk about here is the the data type, uh, the type contiguous. Basically, it describes a contiguous region of um, of a basic data type like MPI int or MPI double. 
So um, basically, you, you should just say, I, I'm creating a, a data type of uh, a, 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 with a certain length of, ex, of a basic data type, um, or, or whatever, the, whatever the, the old type is. So if you have, uh, let's say, if you have an MPI double and you can create a contiguous data type for that, then you end it up with something like the, like the left figure here. But the old type here can also be a derived data type. So in the right example, we have the a structured type, which is non-contiguous. Okay, those, uh, those five blocks here. There's a, five block, a, five, a size of roughly five blocks here. But only only those those three are the, uh, the actual data that we care about. Okay, um, so we if we use struct as the as the as the old type and create a contiguous, we ended up with something like that. Okay, so that's contiguous data type. The second thing is a, a vector type. So vector type is a, a more complex than contiguous, and we we still have a, we still have a a basic a, a base old type that you use to that uh, identify the the blocks in the in the green uh, uh, but instead of having a contiguous uh, region that's decided de determined by the counts we have uh, we can we can have a we have a block size and a stripe so uh, in this case basically you can you can say the the data layout is I have these blocks group I have these cells in uh, group into small blocks, and I have a block length on that. And there's a there's a stride between each of these blocks, so I can skip some of the data, like the like the white region here, and create a create a uh, data layout like this. Okay. So these these are the two data types um, we are going to need for the hands-on. But after that, we also have more complex type. But I'm not going to go through all these details because you can, you can, honestly, it's just quite boring hearing me talk about this. You can, uh, you all can go look at this. So um, the last, the last piece I want to talk about is in, in order to create a data type, you you need a little, a little bit more than that. So you need to. Um, you need to call the type commit once you once you create the data type to uh, to actually uh, tell the library that this is um, because the library could do some optimization to uh, internally to, um, to reduce the complexity of what whatever the complex uh, um, layout you are creating for the for the process of the library. So with the with this data type, you can basically is yes, you can. For these non-contiguous non-contiguous buffers, you can just hand hand the buff, the the pointer to the buffer to MPI send or MPI receive and say I want to send a one count of this data type, which is whatever the data layout is, and the library will come in and say Oh, I need to access this piece of data, this piece of data, and and skip all this and and take that piece of data and put them out all over the network and. And on the receiver side, the receiver will say, oh, I, I, I received maybe 10 bytes of data, and they need to be put into these, these spots. OK, that, so that's, that's what the data type does. Data type just gives you a way to tell the library how these data should be um, put into the, the actual, uh, actual address. So um, if you have a super complex data type, it will, it will take some time. OK, so there's, there's a performance penalty on that if you have Really complex and irregular, and this data needs to be put all over the place. There, there's a price to pay on that. Okay, so back to our back to a hand, hands-on example. I, oh shoot, spend too much time. So um, basically, we need to create two data types. We can create a we can create a vector type for each column, because um, so basically you have. Your in in our example, your your old type will be MPI double, and your block size will be one because each each uh, each cell are uh, just uh, just uh, there, we don't have like two cells glued together, and the stride will be the will be BX which is uh, with BX plus two which is the size of the size of the row, and to simplify your code, you can also create a contiguous type for the north and the north and the south boundary. Okay. 
So um, with that, uh, that's that's I want to talk about. Uh, then if you if you want, you can start from the non-blocking P2P stencil.c and try to uh, modify the communication part uh, into into uh, a derived data type version. And we have a solution for your reference in there, but uh, I will always say this, try to do this yourself before uh, picking to that solution. And, and we'll be around if you have any questions. The question, uh, can you comment on choosing a good tag value? A good type value? Uh, so, so the tag is, is I mean, it's just an arbitrary integer, um, and and so it's really application specific. That that uh, you know, if you have a tag, say, you know, I think in the uh, master worker example, um, a tag might desc might describe a particular task that uh, you know the master scheduler is wanting a particular uh, worker process to execute. So you know, it may use tag zero for one task and tag one for another task. I mean, it's it's really it's all dependent on your application, and uh, you know that the the tags are only meaningful, um, you know, they're only given meaning by by your uh, by your message types. So, um, you know, most most applications I think just start at zero and go from there. Uh, if I if I had to guess, so I I have a little bit of follow up on that. So the the one thing one thing we uh, you, to think about when you when you decide whether you want to create a tag, uh, whether you want to use a specific type uh, tag for your communication is that uh, imagine you have two processes and you have rank zero and sending message to rank one, and and you're doing non-blocking send non-blocking send receive, okay. And if you if you are doing two send, okay, there there are there are like arrived arrived they will you you send them in order and on the receive side they, they, they would arrive in order okay so you have you you have two you have to receive to match with them but uh, if you want if you want to have an out of order match then you can use the tag to control it I don't think we have an example to show here but basically is um, I mean, with with one with just uh, one process without multi-threading, that that may not may, sound, um, may not make much sense. But if you have like two threads on the, on the same process trying to send to one process, uh, the other process, which um, you uh, it will be much better if you try to identify where uh, which uh, which thread or or which which message that uh, the receive is actually matching instead of just using. Uh, uh, any source or any tag to like like catch them all. Uh, so if you really uh, if you really want to control the ordering of the message, you can you can do it through tags. Okay. Uh, there was a question about building the stencil example. There is a make file included, but I had modified it for the Cray system. So uh, the CC variable inside the make file is set to the Cray CC compiler. If you're compiling this locally, you'll, you'll want to edit the make file and change that to MPI CC, assuming you have an MPI uh, available in your path to use. But the make file that's distributed uh, was set up for uh, was set up for the Cray. Uh, there's uh, and another question is about the inputs to the stencil program. So I believe there is. Uh, there uh, are yes. example inputs. I think we have a. Uh, you could run it a couple of times to show some examples. Uh, let, let me Actually, we're not. See. Are we sharing anymore? Someone else took over. I think. Uh, do we have the? Let me see the. So, um, so if you are not running on uh, water, you need to uh, change this to MPI CC, assuming you have an MPI installation locally. And uh, and then run make. It will, okay, it will create this stencil. So the um, let's let's say we run with maybe four processes. Okay, 
So there's uh, several uh, um, parameters you need to put in. So the first first thing is is the is the size of the global uh, the global uh, grid, which is which is it's an n by n grid. So in here I'm putting 100 means it's a 100 by 100 metal plate. That this is the the global global mesh size. And the second thing is the is the heat that each heat source is uh, put put into the plate for each iteration. And we have three heat source and this and here I'm saying that each iteration I'm putting a heat of 10 in there. And the third parameter is how many iterations I, I wanna I want to do for this simulation. And here is 1000. And the last two is uh, is the px and py that you look into the code that you have seen you can see in the code. And the PXPY here is the number of process uh, determining the, the size of the process grid, which in, in our in our slides is three by three. But that needs to your PX PX times PY need to be equal, need to equal to the total number of processes here. Since we have four, uh, we can do two by two. Or if you want, you can do like one by four. Okay, here I'm, I'm going to do two by two, like this. So that's that's all the parameter you need to run the run the experiments, and that's that's the result on my on my local uh, on this local laptop. So if you um, if you're running on if you're running on the the large machine. As long as the, these three parameters are the same, okay, you should get the same last hit number here. These two are just related how how fine you want uh, even to uh, decompose the, the problem space in order to uh, parallelize them. So if you have if you have uh, if you have thirty, let's say uh, if you have thirty two. If you're trying to run with 32 processes, and you can do uh, a four by eight, maybe. Um, uh, uh, the question was, uh, when sending a derived data type, does a does the receiver need to receive that res uh, same data type or not? Uh, the answer is no. That you can you can re you can send uh, uh, a vector on one side and receive into contiguous on the other side. There's no requirement that the the data types match. Now that what what MPI specifies is that the, the type signature needs to match, which is kind of a subtle definition. But essentially, you know, if you have 100 integers on one side and 100 integers on the other side, regardless of how they're laid out in memory, 100 integers is the type signature. And so if you're sending, you know, it non-contiguous on one side, receiving it in contiguous the other side, that's fine. The signatures match, uh, but the, there's nothing that requires the layouts to be the same uh, on, on the two sides of the communication. Another, uh, and, and kind of along those lines, another thing to note is that uh, we covered both blocking and non-blocking communication. Um, you don't have to match, you can match blocking communication with non-blocking on this other side. I think uh, one of the examples I showed, an iSend will, you know, you can receive, uh, use blocking receive from a non-blocking send and vice versa. And in fact, there's other types of send and receive operations um, in MPI and they're all interoperable. They, uh, um, there's, there's nothing that states you have to use the same type of uh, blocking or non-blocking on either side of a, of a communication call. Well, thank you very much. So again, if you want to work on the exercise and ask questions, feel free to stick around and post your questions. Otherwise, we'll see you tomorrow, same time as this, today. Thanks to the Aragon team very much. Thank you.